We pursue the God who is passionately pursuing a lost world. We do this with one another. Through worship, by the word, to the world. Here's where I want to start on a very depressing note. We no longer live in a Bible-friendly world. We prove that. Niels Peter Limke, here he is. The patriarchal narratives are fiction, not reality. By the way, the book from which this comes, called Prelude to Israel's Past, you know where I bought it? Bibles Plus. Look at this. The patriarchal narratives are fiction, not reality. That world does not represent a real world. It stands outside the usual representation of time and space. As a matter of fact, neither the narratives nor their world can be dated to any precise period. That's pretty much what scholarship thinks of the Bible these days. Here's Israel Finkelstein. Combination of archaeological and historical research demonstrates that the biblical account of the conquest and the occupation of Canaan by the Israelites is entirely divorced from historical reality. Okay, I could give you a thousand quotes, but those two will suffice. We live in a world that is not terribly Bible friendly. Um, here's one more. This has specifically to do with us um, in the Wall Street Journal. A few years ago, um, William Deaver, a uh, terrific archaeologist, I've had him here in Albuquerque twice to speak to my students, uh, not about the patriarchs. Uh, he, he doesn't believe that part of the Bible is historical, um, but he does a pretty good job in the Iron Age with, King, with David and Solomon and all that. He says this, no responsible scholar goes out with a trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. And he was aiming directly at me. Well, this is how I respond. No responsible scholar digging in the Holy Land goes out without a trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. You just don't do that. And I'll tell you why. And I, you've heard me say it 13 times now over the years. Um, that's simply because the Bible is still the best historical geographical text we have preserved from antiquity, period, bar none. It's just the way it is. I'm sorry, uh, liberal friends. That's just the fact. Um, now, we have been involved in, in Sodom, and I want to bring you... By the way, we're going to end up with the second coming tonight. I mean, not actual. I haven't made that kind of an arrangement. <laughs> we're not going to, like, end with the rapture tonight. I, was, I told Brian I was going to tell you that we have figured out uh, with a team of mathematicians... Uh, from the biblical text precisely when the rapture will, will the second coming will occur right down we think to the last hour or two um, and uh, I was going to take you right up to the end and say and it is oops we're out of time but no we're not going to go that far but we are going to end up with the second coming and, um, and we're going to tie Sodom with the second coming so we'll see how we can do that um, but we've been involved with Sodom and and at the bottom line of it is this. It is absolutely the best possibility of providing a test case to prove whether or not the Bible is historically factual or not. It's absolutely the perfect test case. Here's why. Because it's accessible. Because the Bible geography is so specific as to its location, and I'm not going into that tonight, but it's so specific as to its location that it was really easy to find. People credit me with having discovered the city of Sodom. Kind of. But I can't really claim, lay claim to that discovery simply because if someone gave me a map of New Mexico and said, find Santa Fe, and if I followed the map and Drove to Santa Fe and I found, San I said, what town is this? Santa Fe. I found it. The map is right. Could I take credit for f discovering Santa Fe? No. Well, I can't take credit for discovering Sodom because the biblical text is so specific as to the location of Sodom that all we did was follow the map. Follow the biblical map, 
took us to the location, and then we picked it up from there with archaeology to demonstrate, or not, that the Bible was exactly correct about the city of Sodom and all the other cities of the plain. So um, we were able to, to get involved in that. We've been doing it for 13 years. And it's the perfect test case because most people doubt the book of Genesis. Most scholars doubted that Sodom and Gomorrah ever existed at all. And um, so it's perfect. And I said, well, what about Noah's Ark? Well... There is no archaeology associated with Noah's Ark because nobody knows where it is. And everybody who thinks they know, know where it is, uh, think it's not there. there. There's nothing associated with reality with Noah's Ark right now. Does it exist? Did it exist? Certainly. But nobody knows. And, uh, but Sodom has a map. And if you go to that location, we can deal with it archaeologically, scientifically, and historically. So, it was the perfect case, and in fact, we were able to, um, to do some very important things, and I'm going to share those with you sequentially uh, in a little bit. But first, I have to update you on this season. Now, I know you woke up this morning going, what I really need today is a fix of lots of rocks and dirt. You know... When I put these things together, Danette always says to me, nobody wants to look at rocks and dirt. I mean, you know, cut the pictures down for Pete's sake. No, I love to, I hope you like looking at this stuff because it's just cool. You're going to look into a biblical city. We're going to see some things that are talked about in the Bible. I mean, it's just cool. So here it is, for better or worse, here's this season. But I also want to show you some archaeology in process. Um, here's our site. It's really, really big. Um, here's our site from a distance. You see the upper city. You can't even see the lower city. All that area of green around, that's all part of the site. It's all part of the city. They're growing bananas all over the place. And uh, you know, sometimes they wind up destroying part of the city by planting bananas. But it's okay. Because the upper city is such a big pile of rocks that you can't plant anything there, so it's pretty safe. And so here, this red circle represents where we're excavating right now. So the excavation from the last, in fact, the last three seasons is in that location. Let's draw it in a little closer, and you see the first glimpse of Camel One. I love Camel One. Camel One is our truck. <laughs> it's our Mitsubishi pickup truck, which we bought. Not this season, but the previous season. And uh, we never had one up to this point. Uh, man, it has, it's amazing. It takes our stuff up the hill, down the hill. Takes people to the hospital when they fall and break legs. That never happens. Well, it did once. But, uh, so, but when we need stuff, when we always need things, there's always errands to run. It goes and gets our hot lunches and so on and so on. So um, there it is. I'll show you a close-up of her. But she's, uh, she's amazing. And uh, Calvary Church was part of purchasing that truck. I think that's really cool. So I have to report, you know, it makes me report on all this stuff. What you spend our money on? So we get a little bit closer. Now this draws us a little bit closer into the excavation. You can see that uh, for those of you who, are, who have seen past pictures, it's looking different. It's looking like something's going on there. Tighten down just a little bit more. That red arrow is where we're digging. You can't see it. Why? Because it's down. It's down. We're three and four meters down. So um, we'll get into that. Now, this, now we're looking down into it. Now, I want you to look at that picture. This, is, this was taken on the first day of the dig season this year. So there it is. This is the excavation as it looked at the end of the 2017 dig season. Now I want you to look at that carefully. Now I'm going to keep that red circle in the picture because it's going to keep, it's going to circle the same area in each of the next several slides. Okay, I want you to just note the changes. So we're going to go from that to this. That's a few days in to this season's excavations. This is the same area. Now I want to take you to the end of the season. 
That's the same place, same area. Um, so that's how it goes, slowly but surely, over the five and six weeks of the dig season, the dirt comes off slowly. And what you're looking at right there is the Middle Bronze Age palace of King Bera, the city of Sodom, time of Abraham. That's what you're looking at right there. So that's uh, pretty cool. And I'll show you some, uh, some details of it. Here it is, looking at it from a slightly different angle. Just showing the excavation in progress. By the way, that whole area... we has literally 40, 50, 60 gigantic, you know, the big dump trucks you see moving dirt around town, five, six yards of, of stuff. About 40 or 50 of those total taken out during this dig season. All by trowel, dustpan, goofa, the rubber, the, the recycled tire, um, buckets that we use, all going out by hand. Uh, it's a slow process, but boy, do we get, do we move some dirt uh, with our volunteers and some of you, by the way, some of you have been on the dig. Would you stand? If you've been on the excavation, stand up. Cool. Yeah. Um, we love our digging, and every one of you could volunteer. If we had this many diggers in a season, wow, could we get the, get the dirt moving? And um, so this is what it looks like. And um, that little bit right there, just shaded it in a bit, that's mud brick. So the city is stone foundations, mud brick superstructures, and the palace is here being swept for the first time in almost 3,700 years. So sweeping the floor. Um, we find a lot of pottery, and the pottery gets scrubbed up. And then, of course, it goes into its, um, its buckets and into the tra drying trays. From the drying tray... By the way, that little tag is important because it follows the pottery all the way through from its bucket, field bucket, into the washing, soaking bucket, into the drying tray. And eventually, uh, the drying trays are all laid out. This is just a few of them. By the way, this season, we registered almost 1,200 sherds from separate vessels. So over 1,200 distinct separate vessels from the palace uh, that we excavated this year. Amazing. We keep about 10%. So about, that just represents 10%. The rest we toss. We keep the best, the, the, the ones that tell us um, what kind of pottery, what kind of vessels we're dealing with. So it goes here, and then it goes to the reading table once a week on a Friday or a Saturday, the end of the dig week, on our day off. It's really not a day off. Uh, the volunteers get to go on neat, go to neat places like Petra and other places, but the staff has to stay there and work. So we work, and this is what we do. And um, we read, examine every single diagnostic rim handle base, uh, every diagnostic sherd that comes through the excavation. We examine it. And so it's a rigorous process. All of that stuff is eventually packed up at the end of the season and shipped by DHL back to the U.S. And we always pray that it gets here. And Dr. Phil Sylvia, who's our Director of Scientific Analysis, uh, always is in charge of packing everything up and it eventually makes it back here to Albuquerque. Um, on the left, this is um, Dr. Craig Olson. And on the right, uh, the newest member of our professional staff is Dr. Muhammad Najjar, who is Jordan's top archaeologist. Um, last year, he finished a 20-year project down in, in the uh, southern desert of Jordan. And um, uh, he, he called me one day, and he said, uh, you need some help? <laughs> and I said, yes, of course, because I've known Muhammad for, for a long time. In fact, he was working for the DOA 13 years ago when we first started. And... Um, 
So I said, absolutely, and now he is uh, official with the excavation. He is um, our, we call him the chief consulting or senior consulting archaeologist. And uh, what, a, what a jewel he is, what a jewel he is. I wish I could tell you some things uh, that he has said, but I'm not going to risk that to the public eye. <laughs> but he's a terrific guy. We love having him. This, this brings us up. I mean, this really, really uh, pulls us up in terms of uh, uh, the scholarly world. Uh, not that we don't have great scholars on our team, but having Jordan's top archaeologist is not going to hurt. So we're, we are really appreciative of uh, his help. And boy, is he a digger. He's not a theoretician. You put a trowel in this man's hand, and things happen. And um, so he's, he's terrific to have on the, on the excavation. Oh, here's Camel One. And you will see what, what it does every day, up and down the hill several times. It's wonderful. Uh, we absolutely love it. So, well, what do you do with it the rest of the time? Uh, Sultan Mahdi, our director of transportation, uh, gets to keep it and take care of it, pay the insurance on it, and use it as his vehicle uh, for the rest of the year. He has very limited driving, so um, he takes care of it. He keeps it in his compound, keeps it safe, keeps it polished, and um, keeps it in good work and order. This is an oven. Well, that's cool. If you got a palace, you got a cook. We'll say, well, it. If you built that thing up, what is this? This, this is, a, is an orno. Recognize orno? That's the foundation of an orno. That's what kind of oven they use. Well, if they build their houses out of mud bricks, adobes, just like we do here, just like the Pueblos here, why wouldn't they cook with ornos? Well, they do. It's exactly the same thing. Over there, it's, in Arabic, it's called a, a taboon or a tanur. And, um, but it's an oven. It's a clay oven. And uh, here's some more of the walls, the palace walls. You say, well, why aren't the bricks as wide as the wall, as wide as the foundation? Because we carved it away. <laughs> we carved the brick away so we can see the absolute width and the construction style of the foundation. We leave some of the mud bricks in place. And uh, here's another one. Look at the thickness of these walls. The, these are palace walls. Some of them are almost two meters thick, some are a meter and a half thick. It's amazing how big these walls are. And to date, we've uncovered 150 square meters of the palace. We have never yet seen an exterior wall. How do we know, how, how do we know that? Because every wall we find has an intersecting wall going further. We've never found the exterior dimensions yet. It's huge. In fact, it is of truly Mesopotamian proportions. And that's not my words. That's the word of every archaeologist who comes out and looks at it. It's just gigantic, and, um, which is one of the reasons why we're digging it. These are the photos we do at the end of the, uh, end of the season. We're just carefully documenting everything. It has to be photographed. I love this. This is the first interior doorway of the Sodom Palace that we've discovered. So there it is, and we love this doorway because it gives us a sense that people were here. They walked through this door. I can't guarantee that Abraham and Lot walked through that door, but they knew King Bera. They talked to King Bera. They hung out sometimes with King Bera, remember? King Bera accompanied Abraham to go visit Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem. So they knew each other, and here we are right in the patriarchal world. It's like a time machine going back and being able to see where they were. Here's some more. Now that, that beautiful big wall, do you see that big thing at the top? That's not old. We built that thing during the season because we have a big uh, area of ruins that we excavated previously in the previous seasons up above it, and that... Now we're going down well, well below that, so to keep that from eroding away and coming down on where we are now, we built this gigantic retaining wall. And um, we're kind of proud of it. It's kind of cool. A little landscaping for the old, the old Sodom Palace. Now, we have so many of these. I could show you a thousand pictures of the destruction layer. 
But I want you to see something about, what are these? These are jars. Do you see the rims? Do you see the... You know, see the bases there? You see the, the, the walls and the, some of the handles of the vessels? These are storage jars in the palace, and they're all full of grain. Do you see the dark material around them? That's all grain. When the jars were mashed, smashed, exploded, they, it, it sent grain everywhere. It's all black and carbonized. What's interesting about virtually everything we're finding in the palace, now we do find some things on the floor, smashed and moving in a northeasterly direction, yes. We even have a a saddle kern that might appear in one of the photos tonight. Uh, It's a large grinding stone, weighs about 400 pounds, about this big around, it's about that thick, has a nice grinding. You know what a matate is? This is like a matate on steroids. It's this big gigantic thing and it sat on a pedestal, but it's knocked off the pedestal toward the northeast. And you can see where the grain that was on it hit the ground and was running up against the wall. And hundreds of pottery vessels smashed and moving across the floor because the direction of the, of the destruction is moving in that direction. And so everything in this photograph right here, I'd say this, nothing in this photograph was found on the floor. Wouldn't you expect to find the jars and big vessels? We found one vessel that would be about this high, full of grain. We never found the bottom half of it. We found the top half. It was still full of grain, but it was smashed up against the wall very close to these. But it's all airborne. All of this stuff is airborne. It's in the destruction matrix off the floor. It's churned in and mixed with bricks and other kinds of artifacts and other many different kinds of pottery. It's all just... We call it the quizzen artifact. Like you put it in there and hit the button, it just destroys. And it, this stuff is floating. We find vessels, oh, this high off the floor, smashed in the, in the bricks up against the wall. Everything is moving. It's violent. In this same area, I'll show you a little piece in a minute, we found many, many, many Melted mud bricks. Melted. Turned into glass. Just melted. Um, Buckets and buckets and buckets of it. And we're going to find a lot more because as we continue to expose this area. It came from the second, third story. It's all coming down. This must have been way up there on the top of the outside of the building, right in the, the exposure of the main blast. And it's just melting and it's falling down. We just sent it off, uh, in fact, yesterday or the day before, we just sent off a bunch of samples of that to our, uh, our uh, airburst team, our astrophysicists and so on, who are testing all this stuff. And, um, but it's amazing, the destruction. It is violent and it's ugly. And, um, oh, there's Dr. Najjar doing the, I don't know, hula or whatever he's doing. No, it's, um, it's a yeehaw moment. Because he's in, he's in that, that doorway, standing in the doorway, of that first doorway that we discovered. And hey, uh, you get excited, and uh, even if you have a PhD, you get excited. Oh, here's more of the destruction layer. I love this. Look at this. Just this ugly, dark matrix of stuff. It's just amazing. Here's some more. Uh, the entire floor of this particular part of the palace is just covered with pottery. Now, that pottery was on the floor. It got smashed by stuff coming down on top of it, but there's just gobs of it. Just a few little excavation uh, shots. We should put on there, this could be you. Oh, joy, oh, joy. I always wanted to just go dig up dirt. But it is cool. It's fun. Uh, This is what we do. Here's some more. Ah, you recognize those? These are new. These are fresh adobes that we're making, and uh, they have a little bit of uh, um, emulsified asphalt in them, which makes them waterproof. And so we have, right here in this mix, we have four different recipes. And so we're testing the four different recipes to see how they hold up for next year. So here I am... uh, putting the bricks on top of the new bricks 
on top of the old bricks. Now, we're not tying them together. We're not putting mortar or anything on them yet. But eventually, what we're, do what we're doing here is we're going to see which recipes hold up to next year's or later this year and into 2019 rainy season. Okay, The rainy season, how will they hold up? And so uh, we're stacking them. And so each of our preserved mud brick walls from the Middle Bronze Age, from the time of Abraham, gets a, a layer of the new bricks, and we'll see what happens, see if they hold up. If they hold up, we will eventually do some major reconstruction. Uh, you'll get to see the palace sort of come back, uh, at least partially, and we're real excited about that. So the end of the season, you see Salah, see him? Our guy with the kofia on, sitting there. Give you a sense of the size of the amount of material we moved this season. Uh, Salah sitting there sort of resting going, ah, it's over. It's over. He's one of our local workers. Really hard working guy. And um, got, got his bonus, by the way. He's really, really good. And so he's just relaxing. But there it is at the end of the season. And then, of course, uh, we... Put our fence back up, put the signs back up, and hope everybody respects it. And that's the end of the dig season. So there's a little bit of an overview of what we had this year. Um, in 13 years of this project, we have demonstrated, I think, seven important things. Now, I could extend that list, I think, to a hundred things. But Seven really important things relative to the Bible. Okay, so here they are. And by the way, if we don't, I just want you to get a sense from those photos of what we do year after day after day after day for six or seven weeks a year, year after year after year after year. What, is, what does it end up doing? Where do we go? Well, here's where we go. Number one, Sodom, here's what we've proved. Sodom was an extreme, extremely ancient city of great importance. Okay? Well, the Bible told us that. But now we know it factually. Absolutely, it is true. Sodom was an extremely ancient city of great importance. It survived, it thrived as one of the largest cities in the Levant. Without, without a break, for almost 3,000 years before it was destroyed. So it's an amazing site, and um, it's become actually what, what archaeologists call a type site, and which means it has all the periods, has everything, has all the evolution of the pottery, you can see all the subtle uh, movements of history at it, and so uh, this is very important, because it is, in fact, the city of Sodom. How big is it? Well, it's 62 acres surrounded by massive fortifications. If you spread out the settlement footprint of the site, it goes well over 150 acres, which makes it the largest continuously occupied city in the southern Levant, in the Bronze Age. The largest one that's continuously occupied. There are only two others that even get larger than it, but only for short periods of time. And they are not occupied during some of the periods where Tal Hamam is occupied. So Sodom is the biggest, longest running, successful city in the southern Levant up until the time of its destruction. And here it is, Dr. Lane Rittmeyer's uh, drawing of the Middle Bronze Age city with its upper city and lower city. And of course, we are excavating in that upper, upper city right on the top to the right. Second thing we've proved, Sodom was a large, wealthy city-state with many satellite towns and villages, exactly as described in Genesis. Archaeology proves that. We have Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboim. These are the satellites of Sodom. Sodom's the big one. It's always mentioned first. It's the only one ever mentioned by itself. It's the big one of all. Now, what's interesting is, is that this is the way the map looked before we started our project. Oh, I'm sorry. You can take everything out. I thought I had another slide in there. But the whole eastern side of the Jordan River north of the Dead Sea was a blank 
before we started our project on the archaeological maps. It was blank. But here's from our discoveries. Here are the cities and towns. I mean, let's look at it this way. These are archaeological sites in the land of the Kikar. That's Genesis 1928. The land of the Kikar, identifiable today as a result of the Tal Hamam excavation project. That's what the map looks like. It used to be blank. So, there it is. Not only, well, you say, well, which ones are Sodom and Gomorrah? How did you tell? There's too many. Has more than you need, yes, but some are bigger than others, and uh, it's fairly obvious which ones are which. And uh, Gomorrah is just a 20-minute walk up the road, and Admin Zebuim a little bit further up the road, and they're in south to north order, as we believe the Bible gives them. So there they are. Third thing, Sodom and the cities of the Kikar thrived during the time of Abraham in the Middle Bronze Age. Abraham was a wealthy man. He had many flocks and herds, very wealthy individual. The Middle Bronze Age is the height of the great Canaanite civilizations. Okay, he fits into that period so well because if there was a period in the Levant when you could become a wealthy man as a, as a, as a nomad, as a tent-dwelling clan leader, this was the time. And so um, we've proved it. Now, one of the ways we've proved it, there are many, many ways, but um, I'm a pottery guy. Ceramics is my deal. And I love this. In the palace of Sodom, by the way, this has never been seen at any other palace that we know of in the Levant. But at the palace of Sodom, common vessels that you would find almost everywhere, I mean, you need storage jars, you need cups and bowls and plates, you need lamps, you need, for various functions, you need the common pottery. We find it all over the site in other places administrative, and in domestic context. But it's not finished. It's plain. It's not decorated in any way. And we know of no pottery, even in palaces in other cities around the Levant during this same period, that decorate all of their commonware and make it uncommon. Now, in the palace, we have fine burnished wares and what we call quality wear, fine wear, beautiful things. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about everyday garden variety plates, bowls, and storage jars. But this is what they look like. The exterior of virtually every vessel, com common vessel, we find in the palace is, and I had to come up with a term for it because it's so unique, it is multi-slip, cross-wiped palace wear. That's what we call it now. And, the, and every vessel has multiple colors of slip or paint put on it in different directions. Not only that, but look at this. This blew my mind. Who finishes the bottom of a bowl? Look at the base. Even under the base, inside the base, it's finished. We have three or four colors of slip here, white and black and yellowish and so on. It's all wiped on. Every vessel is unique. It's, and it comes in like 20 different shades of, of styles, but it's all this multi-slipped cross white stuff. Here's another vessel. This is a side of a big storage jar. Who does this to a storage jar? It's just a crate for putting grain in. In the palace of Sodom, there are no common vessels in this sense. Everything is special. We think they have a special set of potters working for the palace. We also have proved that as the Bible suggests in the attempted abduction of the angels by the men of Sodom, men and boys of Sodom, 
you recall, I've talked about that here. I'm not going to repeat that tonight. But we have in Sodom roots that go back into the Bronze Age world of the Minoans of Crete, of the Middle Mediterranean, of the Aegean area. And their culture had a way of raising their boys, their adolescent young men, in a homosexual, pederastic relationship with an older man for eight years. Required. Everybody had to do that. And um, so it was, a, it was quite a stunning thing for us to, to look back at that and go, well, that's not right. <laughs> shouldn't do that. But you recall in the book of Genesis says there was a great out, outcry against the city of Sodom. Well, who is crying out against the city of Sodom? Canaanites crying out against the city of Sodom? Why? Well, the Canaanites sacrificed their children and, you know, they, they had temple prostitutes and they had all... I mean, the Canaanites didn't exactly have a moral culture, but they were appalled and crying out against the city of Sodom because of its perceived departure from something that would be acceptable even in Canaanite culture. And so, um, and the Bible tells us about that. Remember what happened to the angels. Um, at our site, we have pillared Minoan-style architecture. This is in our gateway on the lower tell. Nobody builds gates like this. They have chambered gates, no pillars. Just gatehouses with some chambers. That's it. No pillars. We have a pillared gateway, and it's probably got a light well. And this is Lane Rittmeyer's uh, model of it. It's a multi-story building with a light well, so we can get light into the lower stories. This is Minoan-style architecture. We have Minoan-style appliques, decorations on our pottery, the down-horn bulls. Uh, that we see in the upper left, that's from Hammam. The upper right, that's from Hammam. All those other ones are from Crete. Very interesting. Um, we have these connections. We found something really cool. I love this thing. Um, this is a top of an incense burner or a very large a ritual lamp from the palace and um, has this crossing kind of snakish decoration. And then on the outside around the collar it actually has a decoration a part of it's broken off but when you restore it it looks like this and um, what does that look like to you it's a proto-ionic column capital and column okay this is where it comes from this is the proto-ionic there it is this is from the Aegean. This is where it comes from. And now it shows up at our site. In other words, the top of the incense burner is artistically held up by a series of proto-ionic columns from the Aegean world. It's really amazing. And then we have beautiful pieces like this uh, that are totally a departure from the from the rather crude geometric Canaanite designs on some of the pot pottery. This is a beautiful, beautiful uh, um, execution of a, uh, a flowering vine. And uh, this can be traced also to the Minoan culture of the Aegean world. The fifth thing we've done is to show that these cities were destroyed violently during the time of Abraham during the Middle Bronze Age. Now, how do we know it was destroyed during the Middle Bronze Age, during that time? Well, the pottery tells us that, but also confirmed by radiocarbon dating, and we take samples. Here we are taking some samples of carbon. We really look for grain and things like that. We're taking that carbon, and we're putting it in jars, and it comes back to uh, our lab here in Albuquerque, and then it's shipped off to the various radiocarbon labs around the country for analysis. And those dates are coming back square on, around 1700 BC, which is what our pottery also tells us. So we have a firm date now on the destruction of Sodom, which helps us date Abraham as well. Uh, sixth thing, Sodom and the land of the Kikar were wiped out in an instant. They just weren't destroyed. 
They were destroyed in an instant, 400 square kilometers of intense civilization wiped out by a superheated plasmic impact produced by a meteoritic airburst event. By the way, that's exactly what Genesis 19 says. Not in this exact same terminology, but it's close. It actually says, and God rained down fire and not sulfur, gopreet, burning stones from Yahweh out of the heavens. Well, it sounds like a cosmic airburst to me. It's coming right out of the sky and destroying this area. And of course, you've seen this if you've seen my presentations. Um, the pottery shirt melted with the melted glass on the surface and the trinitite from ground zero of the first atomic bomb explosion. They're identical because the heat index is the same. That shirt was subjected to about 15 to 20,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for a fraction of a second and melted into glass. We have lots of that stuff. Here's, here's one of our melted mud bricks or a piece of melted mud brick from this season. And of course, uh, a glass um, melt product from close by the site and um, proving that we have a high heat event exactly as the Bible describes. The seventh thing, Sodom and the land of the Kikar remained uninhabited for seven centuries after its cosmic destruction. I just wrote a paper for a secular uh, book that I was asked to write a, a chapter on uh, Tal Hamam and um, I want you, this, this is a diagram. It shows it goes from right to left, and uh, because that diagram was produced in Israel, <laughs> but it goes from right to left, and it's tracking the rise and fall of the Dead Sea levels through time. So when the Dead Sea levels are going up or it's high, what does that tell you? Lots of rainfall during that time frame. When it's dropping, the rainfall is stopping. It's, 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 it's famine time. It's it's a drought. Now I want you to look at this. Here is the precise moment of Sodom's destruction. Look what happens to the regional climate and the Dead Sea level right in co conjunction with the time of this destruction. It was such a massive event that it actually affected the climate for a while and made it really difficult for folks uh, going into the, to the late Bronze Age. So we can actually see it in the climatological studies that something drastic happened about 3,700 BC. Uh, I'm sorry, about 3,700 years ago, about 1700 BC. Now, here's my second coming thing. As it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, Remember that statement? Or we could put it this way. Slouching toward Sodom. I sort of took that from uh, Judge Bork's, remember him, uh, book, Slouching Toward Gomorrah. <laughs> okay. Um, what did he mean by that? That's what our culture's doing. We're slouching in the direction of Sodom. And let's look at it biblically. Here's Luke 17. As happened in the days of Lot, they were, they were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and burning stone, or sulfur if you like, from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. Ezekiel. Now, say, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. How was it in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, God tells us in Ezekiel 16. Now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. By the way, who's the, who's the sister? Jerusalem. But he's bringing up Sodom to make a point. This was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters, those are the other satellite cities, she and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. 
They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. By the way, what does that mean? As you have seen. It means that God left enough ruins around that they could see it. It's just a half a day from Jerusalem. Just half a day's walk. They could, they, they, many of them passed it. Said, you've seen this, and that's why I destroyed these cities, because of these things. Now, um, let's do a little comparison between Sodom and current Western culture. I could have just said America. Okay? As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. How close are we? Are we close? Well, arrogant. They were arrogant. I say it's, it's this phrase, it's all about me. It's all about me and mine and what I do. They were arrogant. Little concern for other people. Oh, well, let's get off that one. <laughs> Overfed. I, did, I heard uh, yesterday, the day before, 35% of people in, in the United States are considered overweight. Another 30% are considered obese. Now, I'm not saying there was anybody overweight or obese in Sodom. That's not the point. That's not what, the, what this means. In fact, some of the other translations go a, a little bit different. What this means is overfed. This was an idiom for uber wealthy. Just filthy rich. Just oozing with money. They could do anything they want. They thought they were invincible. They could build whatever they wanted, buy whatever they wanted, buy whomever they wanted. They could do anything. That's what they thought. They were overfed unconcerned they're unconcerned I have my own problems I have my own stuff to deal with yes yeah we've totally turned in on ourselves I mean you can can you see it can you see our time and day yes ignore the poor and the needy I call this the accumulation of stuff why well because as, as we look, as I encounter people in houses and garages, do we have stuff? We have so much stuff, we can't even pull it out. We can't even use it all. We have just stuff just oozing and popping out that we can't even store. I know people, I know several people that own or rent storage places because they don't have enough room at their house for all their stuff. They never use it. They never touch it, but they have to store it somewhere. We have stuff. In the city of San Francisco, this just came out like yesterday, the day before. In the city of San Francisco, we have the wealthiest per capita neighborhoods in America. And do you know that the charities that deal with the poor and the needy those who need help of all kinds, up and down society, that those charities who try to help those people in San Francisco are going broke because the people in San Francisco are not giving the money. They're not supporting them. They're the wealthiest people in the country, but they're not givers. They're takers. Well, I think you could multiply that across America. Haughty. The ex exaltation of self. They're haughty. Yeah, we love where we are. We wouldn't trade who we are and where we are. We like it the way it is. We like it safe. We like it not having to touch the people who are needy and so on. Haughty. Arrogant. And, of course, this one had to come along. Detestable practices. 
People call this the new normal. What's the new normal? Do you know that Albuquerque Public Schools, within recent years, brought their teachers together to teach them how to be sensitive to the dozens and dozens of potential sexual orientations of their students? Everything's normal. If your child has a sexual orientation to trees or automobiles or... It's normal. I don't know what to say. Um, by the way, I know teachers that literally got up shortly thereafter walked out of the classroom. It just can't control it anymore. Can't do that anymore. Um, there's no morality left in America. There's, there is nothing that could be classed as immoral because everything is just interpreted as normal. You're just normal and then we'll put you in with all the other kids. Well, joy. Um, one more scripture. I like what Paul says here. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, or in this translation, able to acknowledge the truth. Sounds like America. Close with this. What does Isaiah say in his day? And I think this applies to our day. Goes right back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahweh. You rulers of Sodom, who's he talking to? Any government, in this case Israel, but you could apply this to any government, anywhere, anytime, any people. Hear the words of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the case, the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Come now. By the way, we always take this out of context. We quote this. We forget to quote what comes before it. Come now. Let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. We don't need to stand with the crowd. We can stand out uh, in the redemption of Jesus Sodom is real. That's the point. Sodom is real. This is not some rhetorical literary metaphor. It's real. The destruction, of, the warning against Sodom is real. The destruction of Sodom was real. And so is the second coming of Jesus. So is the second coming of our Lord, who will purge this world with his righteousness. Well, that's the end of that. Let's pray. Father, we stand amazed in the presence of a holy and righteous God who gives us every opportunity to lay down our will, to repent, to submit to our Creator, to His Messiah, to You, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins who gives us every opportunity, gives us every mercy, but yet somehow, as a nation, as a civilization, we have collectively turned our hearts and our minds against you and have opted for our own will and our own way. Father, lead us to seek you. Lead us to repentance. And it's all because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
What binds us together is devotion to worshiping our Heavenly Father, dedication to studying His Word, and determination to proclaim our eternal hope in Jesus Christ.